Hello everyone and welcome to Gladney University. My name is Jennifer Lanter and I'm the Vice President of Communication and Education for Gladney and we are so excited that you're here today. We have a wonderful presentation for you. I've been looking forward to this uh, since we booked Ebony. Her, our presenter's name today is Ebony Mack and she, uh, I actually first heard her from the National Council for Adoptions conference earlier this spring and I loved, loved her speaking style and I love the way she related to the audience even though we were all virtual um, her smile came through and her warmth and I loved her topic obviously and I'm very excited to talk about um, our topic today which is bridging the gap strengthening cultural competencies of transracial adoptive parents which is very important my favorite part of that title is bridging the gap um, Ebony, Ebony and I were talking before the presentation and to me that's the key part is that um, we all come to the table, as, especially as adoptive parents, wanting to be the best parents we can for our children. And it's important that we understand where they're coming from and their culture and celebrate their culture and, and know how to talk about their culture with them. And Ebony is going to do a great job of teaching us how to do that today. I'm also excited because um, Ebony has agreed to do a podcast with us after the presentation. So um, later in December, we're going to be um, scheduling a podcast. And so if any questions or anything come up during the presentation, please just send me an email um, after the presentation and we can add that to the podcast and we can talk about that for you. And that would be great reason for you to tune in. I want to go over just a couple of housekeeping things before I turn it over to Ebony. I also want to apologize for um, if you hear lawnmowers and leaf blowers, my neighbor is getting their yard done. Just a great little side benefit of working from home. Um, but today I wanted to talk to you a little bit about our CE process. So make sure that you're registered and make sure that um, you are or you wouldn't be in this presentation. And then right after the presentation, you will get like a little link that pops up and you can just fill out that information and then that will send you to um, that will help help us get your CEUs to you and you'll get them in seven to ten business days from now to the email that you registered with. If for some reason you miss that little pop-up um, thing at the end, don't worry, you'll get an email later and in that email you can just fill out that little survey and the same thing will email your uh, CE certificate seven to ten days. Also if you have any questions during the presentation just put them in the chat and I'll be um, just chiming in every now and then um, um, with Ebony and I'll be asking her those questions so we can get your questions answered. I know Ebony likes a lot of interaction so don't be afraid to hold back those questions. We want to we want to have those. So now I introduce to you Ebony. Ebony welcome. We're excited to have you. Thank you so much Jennifer. Let me share my screen. Everything look okay? It looks great. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, and welcome everyone to this presentation. I'm really, really excited to share this information with all of you. I believe if you would have seen the live that I did for Gladney about a week ago, you heard me talk about myself and talk about this training. Uh, so I won't repeat it all, except for I do want to note this that Come as you are, all of you. I'm really, really enthusiastic about this topic. I'm really looking forward to communicating with you directly. And if you have questions, please throw them in at any point. Again, um, as she stated, I just, I just love the interactive part of this. And I miss it because we're all distanced from each other. So some of the aims for this presentation are that I really hope to, as the title says, bridge the gap to alert you to some of the cultural markers and commonly known faux pas that happen just, and, and not specifically for people in the black community, but just happen if there are any two people of a different background interacting with each other. Um, I want to increase your awareness of any racial stereotypes. And I really, really hope to increase your awareness of historical context and privilege. Uh, we're gonna be talking a lot about historical context as I move through this presentation. And so one of the big questions uh, that 
uh, comes up for anyone that is interacting with a black person, whether they're stating explicitly or not. I actually had a coworker not too long ago ask me, so so what is the difference between black and African American and what should I use? And I just thought that's right. You know, it's one of those things that people don't necessarily know and they don't have an understanding about what these terms mean and where they came from. I, I think it's a great question. It's an understandable question, but in order to answer it adequately, we have to first define the terms race and ethnicity. So race, as described by Miriam Webster is, and this is my paraphrasing definition here, but more or less what they wrote is each major grouping into which mankind is considered to be divided on the basis of physical characteristics or shared ancestry. Uh, uh, one little note I want to add in is that the term racism is currently under view by Miriam Webster. They are in the process right now of changing their definition of racism. I think there is a really good argument to be made that if you're changing the definition of racism, that you would also change the definition of race because they are so inextricably linked together. I do not know if Miriam Webster is in the process of changing this definition, but I can tell you when I look at it, one of the things that sticks out to me is the term is considered. It's this sort of passive language that doesn't really tell you what you need to know about what's happening here. Uh, because is considered makes it seem like these ideas just sort of sprung out of nowhere, that they just came about and we all just have this shared understanding when race is a social construct. It is a thing that was created for a specific purpose. And, and I think we're missing a little bit with this definition, but that's a little, that's my little aside. Um, added to that, the definition, again, from Miriam Webster of ethnicity is the state of belonging to a social group that has common or cultural tradition. And so how do we fit this into Black and African American? One, by acknowledging, as I stated, that race is a socially constructed uh, concept that groups people together specifically as the, the three original races as they were created were Caucasoid, which we now use the word white, Negroid, and we now use the word black and the very unfortunate term uh, Mongoloid or what we typically now use the word Asian. And ethnicity, some examples of ethnicities given that context are African-American, Italian-American or Hispanic. And noting that someone that is Hispanic can be of any different race. They can be white, they can be black, they can be Asian. And so with that in mind, black refers to the race of people who descended from Africa and African-American refers to any Americans who have descended from Africa. So this is one of those things where it's like uh, squares and rectangles where uh, essentially all black people, all people who are African American are black, but not all black people are African American. It's the same as like squares and rectangles. All uh, squares are rectangles, but not all rectangles are squares. And so just to further this idea and to give you a visual to go with it, we have the actor on the left. If you're not familiar with him, this is Idris Elba. He is black. He is descended from Africa, but he is a British actor. Again, maybe you don't know that either, but Idris Elba is an actor, he's of relative fame, and he would be considered black, but he could not be considered African-American. The gentleman on the right side is Michael B. Jordan. Michael B. Jordan is an African-American. He is an American person who descended from Africa. Uh, he can also be called black, but Again, Idris Elba could be called Black, but could not be called African-American. Again, I hope that there is some clarity there. And what I want to add to this is that I've encountered a lot of non-Black people who feel as though um, there is something wrong with the word Black. And I know that the terms that we use for people who descended from Africa have changed so many times over the course of our concept of whatever it is. Uh, whether it's Negroid, Black, African-American, whatever, that, that th these terms have changed so many times. So it's understandable that someone may say, well, I don't even know which one is the quote unquote correct term. I, I will tell you the sort of a broad understanding that generally speaking, if someone could be defined as both, they typically don't have an issue 
with either term. And specifically, Black is not a bad word. Again, I think, I think this is very important to note that there are a lot of non-Black people who are hesitant to use that word. I think it feels like it's potentially slur or uh, derogatory in nature, and it absolutely isn't. If anything, many of the Black people that I am aware of prefer the term Black to African American. But there are also some people who, again, could refer to either of these terms and prefer the term African American. You know, your mileage may vary. But generally speaking, you will find people that won't have any strong feelings. Um, if anything, maybe a slight preference towards Black, towards the word that I think a lot of non-Black people have hesitance in using. And so now I want to talk about dog whistles. So if you are not familiar with the term, dog whistles refers to the political usage of words that uh, are they have one surface level meaning, but they are signaling something to different groups of people. The same way like a dog whistle, it has that lower register. So it cannot be perceived by people that have certain auditory uh, capacities, but they can be perceived obviously by dogs. Um, this is essentially the same concept here. And these terms, thug, urban, ghetto, certainly have specific words that you could go to the dictionary and they may not necessarily have a specific racial connotation to them. But what we have found is that over the course of the past few decades, they do have a very specific racial and racist connotation to them, unfortunately. Thug, you know, the, the textbook definition of thug is essentially a ruffian, someone who is aggressive. But unfortunately, over time, the term thug has been connected inappropriately to people of color and Black people, uh, assuming that there is an inherent criminal nature to uh, people of color. The term urban, again, has used in a similar, it has been used in a similar way where essentially it is a default for Black. When someone is trying to talk about Black people in a surreptitious way, but they don't want to use that term or even say people of color is, or say African-American, they may use urban where suburban is coded as white and urban is coded as non-white. And ghetto, um, and obviously the history of the term ghetto predates any connection to people of color, it actually goes back to uh, Jewish people and where they were forced to live. But again, the evolution of that word means that it has more recently been used to refer to locations that typically uh, are found low income and people of color there. And I've seen a lot of people use this term to refer to things that are of lower quality, uh, things that are broken, things that are um, maybe working, but working in an un, uh, unconventional fashion. And I just, you know, want to cue people that these words can be very, very harmful, even if used inadvertently. Uh, it's really important to be aware of our intent versus the impact of things. It is completely understandable if you are coming to this saying, well, I didn't know this and I didn't have this previous knowledge, that is absolutely understandable, but, um, and, and it's okay. And I think what we have to do in these conversations is bring our humility, bring our, our vulnerability into it and say, you know, well, I can't possibly know everything that there is to know about everything, but what I can do is try to arm myself with education, arm myself with information, and then change my behavior moving forward. The idea of anything that I'm sharing with you is not to denigrate you for anything that you've done before, any words that you used before, any um, interactions that you've had with people prior. The hope is that you will take this information and incorporate it appropriately and move forward, making any changes that you would see fit to. And on that note, let's talk about stereotypes. And again, the idea is just to raise your awareness to help you understand some of the different stereotypes that exist in the world. Um, sapphire. So this unfortunate image that you see here is from a cartoon that arose somewhere around the 1940s. Uh, the woman that you see there, obviously both of these people are 
unfortunate caricatures of black people. You see the woman there with the rolling pin. Uh, she has an aggressive stance. You can already tell from this image what this is supposed to convey to you. The term sapphire or ABW, which is shortened for angry black woman, uh, goes back to somewhere around the uh, late 1800s, uh, early 1900s. And this idea that black women are inherently uh, aggressive and nasty and acerbic comes from that. And the idea that Sapphire, uh, this image, this caricature is who we are is one of the stereotypes that many black women, including myself, have had to contend with. Another, so I added this particularly, uh, this, the concept of connecting black people to monkeys is something that, again, I don't know how many people know, and it came up for me a lot within the last year. Uh, my youngest child is, two, she's turning two, actually. She will be two uh, on the 22nd of this month, and interacting with other parents and noticing the frequently, the excuse me, the frequency with which they use the term monkey to describe their kids, let me know that there is a cultural uh, chasm here between many Black people and many non-Black people. And these moms, to for transparency, uh, specifically were white moms. I saw them just lovingly referring to their children as, oh, she's a little monkey. And I get it. I, I understood it in the context, like your kid is small, your kid is kind of running around like a toddler age. They're, you know, climbing on things the way that we associate with monkeys. And I just remember the terror that I felt, uh, the fear that I had that one of them would refer to my daughter as a monkey and having to have that conversation, but knowing that they probably had no concept, they had no understanding of the history of denigrating black people. And as you can see in this image, the white person uh, connected to what we would assume is supposed to be their skull and the caricature of the black person there and what is assumed to be their skull, but is what is clearly a, uh, a so a chimpanzee, a somewhat, some, some sort of primate's skull. Uh, the connection to the idea that Black people are a lesser form of human, that we are a, uh, a primitive form of human is just an old, old, dated, unfortunate racist idea. And again, I just want to raise the awareness so that people know that there is a lot of racist history in uh, referring to Black people as monkeys. So Dragon Lady, uh, I wanted to talk about this. Obviously much of this talk will be specifically about black slash African-American people and children, but again, just raising awareness about racial stereotypes in general, whether or not they are connected to us. Uh, the Dragon Lady stereotype, I've seen a lot of this lately. I don't know if you would have seen the movie Kung Fu Hustle, but this is a still from that movie. Very, very popular, very uh, widely received movie that unfortunately has this connection to this old antiquated concept of the dragon lady, the dragon lady that comes from somewhere around the 1930s, I believe was the first emergence of this in a cartoon of this caricaturized Asian woman who was aggressive and domineering. Um, and this idea that, you know, we typically assume them to be meek, which is also its own stereotype, but that the uh, uh, alternate version of that is this extreme aggressive uh, version. And we saw some of that come up not too long ago. I think it was around 2010 when the book Tiger Mom came out. And there was all of this discussion about how uh, strict and um, maybe aggressive isn't quite the right word, but just very hard line and rigid Asian communities were. And just, it's an unfortunate way that we, in, in trying to understand people, end up inadvertently putting them in boxes. Uh, the Savage, quote unquote, unfortunately, here we have an old advertisement for Boston Baked Beans, where you have this image of a, I assume it's supposed to be Uncle Sam image here, feeding the Native American person and this sort of uh, paternalistic idea that uh, white people came to this country and civilized these quote unquote savages, Native Americans. Again, we have to be aware of these stereotypes in order to 
realize how they are coming up in the images that we consume in the media and talking to our children about them so that we can undo and address the harm that may come about. And here we have the quote unquote terrorist image. Uh, this is actually a image that I took from a movie that I enjoy. Um, well, to be fair, I haven't seen this movie in probably about 15, 20 years. But the last time I saw it, I remember enjoying it very much, True Lies. And that's um, Arnold Schwarzenegger that you can see with his back turned to us, uh, mostly on the left side. And the actor who is centered, um, presented as our caricature of what we know as quote unquote terrorists. The, person of Middle Eastern descent. He has on military regalia. You have these images conjured of things blowing up. And again, it's important to, when we see these images, question where did our idea of a terrorist come from and why does it conjure this image? As opposed to on American soil, the typical person that is a, is a terrorist is a domestic terrorist. Typically, that is a person who is homegrown. He is uh, of black, uh, excuse me, he is a white person. He's usually young. He's usually anywhere from 18 to about 35. Um, and those are the people that are committing most of our terroristic acts in our country. But unfortunately, you hear that word and it has this assumed connection to this image. And lastly, the quote unquote, uh, illegal immigrant. Obviously, the correct term would be to refer to them as undocumented, but I put illegal in there because, again, these are the, these are the stereotypes that exist in the world, and this is the way in which people typically think. This image actually comes from an article that I found that talked about the stereotypes of immigrants and the assumptions that we put on them, that they have low education, that they are um, you know, doing, performing specific jobs and tasks in our country, that they have very little to give to our country, that they don't speak English well, again, and, and, and some of them do, but many of them speak English very well. Again, a lot of this is based on our preconceived notions, some of which we don't even know where they arose from. We just know that they exist and they're out there in the zeitgeist affecting how we think, whether we realize it or not. And I think it's really important, again, to just put these things out there so that we're aware of them, because that's the only way that we can unearth them. And speaking of stereotypes, uh, there is a concept called stereotype threat that speaks to the ways in which we interact with stereotypes personally and how it affects our thinking um, and how we interact with the world. And so th this video here, I'm looking forward to you seeing so you get a better understanding of what that is. Social psychologists have found that performance in any given situation may be influenced by the threat of being negatively stereotyped. Stereotype threat is disruptive and intimidating. The fear is that when facing a negative stereotype, one's performance will confirm that the stereotype is true. The anxiety that the stereotype fosters prevents people from doing their best. It's as soon as you're aware that you could be seen through the, the, the lens of a negative stereotype by the group that you're a part of, uh, if you care about that situation, you could feel some sense of threat that you're going to be treated in terms of that stereotype or perceived in terms of that stereotype uh, or in some way reduced to that stereotype. And it's, it's a kind of threat that, as you can tell from that, happens to everybody because everybody experiences, everybody's a member of some group that is negatively stereotyped. All groups have negative stereotypes. In an interesting experiment conducted by Dr. Jeff Stone, black and white athletes were instructed that they were going to be tested on a golf-related task. When I finish the instructions today, you'll be going into the adjoining room where you'll be given a standardized measure of athletic aptitude developed by sports psychologists and based on the game of golf. The test is designed to measure personal factors correlated with natural athletic ability, such as hand-eye coordination. Any questions about that? 
When a group was told the task was a test of athletic ability, the African-American subjects did better than the white subjects. When I finish the instructions today, you'll be going into the adjoining room where you'll be given a standardized measure of athletic aptitude developed by sports psychologists and based on the game of golf. The test is designed to measure personal factors correlated with ability to think strategically during athletic performance tests. Any questions about that? When told the task was a test of sports strategy, the white subjects outperformed the African-American subjects. In both cases, stereotypes triggered beliefs and fears in the participants that became self-fulfilling. The cute thing of the study is that he reverses the effect by, uh, in a different condition, changing the, uh, the label for the condition. Uh, in this condition, he says to, to them, this is a test of sports strategic intelligence. So there's a, t there's a, a stereotype uh, uh, that now is more likely to intimidate the African-American subjects in this experiment. And indeed, the performance reverses. Under that instruction, uh, whites outperform blacks. Uh, so yes, I think this kind of intimidation, it's a, it's a, 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 I think stereotype threat is, is a cousin to a much more general kind of reputational intimidation uh, that, that we can impose on people uh, and is imposed on us as, as a kind of regular feature of, of social existence. Great, so I, I hope that that helps to illuminate what tends to happen with stereotypes and stereotypes in general, and stereotype threats specifically. The gentleman you saw there, Claude Steele, Dr. Claude Steele, forgive me, um, it brilliantly created this concept to go with this phenomenon. And I think it really is telling about how we interact with these things. One of the most important parts of that, that I hope you take away from it is that everybody experiences this. This is not something that's specific to children of color. This is not something that would be specific to you if you weren't a person of color. This is something that everybody is connected to some group that has some kind of stereotype to it. And I think what is really helpful with understanding that is that it lets you know that, okay, if my child is experiencing this, then I can relate to the ways in which I experience this. And like I referred to a, a few slides ago, the angry black woman stereotype, I know that there have been plenty of interactions that I have had where I have been fearful of being perceived as that. I have uh, withheld my thoughts about certain things. I have declined to speak up in certain situations. And, and we should be aware of how that can interact with our relationship with each other and certainly our relationship with our children. And so now uh, I'd like to talk about uh, African-American vernacular English. I think this is one of the least understood and frankly most almost purposefully misconstrued concepts of African-American culture. And it's, it's really important to me to any opportunity I get to talk about it and hopefully dispel some myths about it. So African American vernacular English is a dialect of English that is spoken by descendants of Africa living in America. Um, it, you may have heard of it before by the, I think this is an unfortunate term, Ebonics, which was essentially a combining of the word, my name, Ebony, with the term phonics. I don't understand why it got that name. It, it sounds cartoonish. It's clearly not indicative of this being a real linguistic feature, an actual legitimate dialect of English. I, I cannot speak to that part of it. But again, you may have heard of it. You may have heard of the controversy around that. I'll talk that about that very briefly, but uh, basically about three decades ago, um, Oakland, did a measure for their school board where they talked about recognizing the language that many of the kids in that particular school board district spoke, which was African-American vernacular English. They wanted to recognize it in order to use it to teach standard English to the kids, acknowledging that they already spoke AAVE and that they could use the linguistic features of AAVE and translate those to standard American English. That was literally what it was. It got 
uh, very misunderstood, very misconstrued, um, and it became misunderstood as uh, teaching all of the kids AAVE, which doesn't make sense. The kids already knew it. Teaching kids that wouldn't even necessarily that be a part of their culture. I, again, there was just a lot of misunderstanding about it. So I like to, whenever I have the opportunity, to dispel the myths about it. Essentially, it is English words with grammar and syntax that uh, arrives from West African languages. So languages like Yoruba, Twi, Igbo, it has very similar syntax and grammatical features to those, but the words are English. And this is completely uncontroversial by people that study language. Linguists of all backgrounds, of all races, are aware of it and have no qualms with it, no, uh, no issues with it. It is not controversial by people who study languages. It, it is unfortunately very controversial by people who aren't familiar with how language works. And um, obviously I could talk about AAVE forever uh, and I won't go into all the details, but I do like to give a little bit of background about what it looks like, because I think it's helpful to know what it looks like to know what it, so you know what it doesn't look like. Uh, zero copula is a linguistic feature where you zero the copula. So if you don't know what a copula is, it is the verb to be. So is, am, are. That's copula. So when you zero the verb to be, you basically have a sentence where you could have the verb to be, but you take out that verb in whatever tense would be appropriate to use it for. And that sentence is still readily understood by the person in whatever uh, language or variation you are using. So the sentence I have there is, uh, they are in the next room. In AAVE, you could say they in the next room, and that would be a completely grammatically correct, appropriate term to use. Zero copula is not specific to AAVE. It also comes up in Russian, Japanese, Arabic, and ASL, just to name a few of the languages where this comes up. So uh, again, this is just one of the ways in which it is uh, an, a variation that has clear rules for it to be correct and for it to be incorrect. Another thing that I like to talk about is the habitual B. The habitual B is the use of the word B to denote that something happens habitually, something that happens uh, with some sort of frequency. So the sentence I have there is every time I see him, he be talking about the same thing. So that is a correct sentence. What I have found, and this is just a little aside, uh, sometimes, uh, for whatever reason, people pretend to be Black on the internet, and I can tell you that one, uh, not just me, many Black people can spot that, but one of the quickest ways to spot it is the use of the term B, because if you're not a fluent speaker of AAVE, it probably seems as though B just kind of gets uh, thrown about uh, haphazardly and randomly when really it's used in a very specific way. Um, and so like in that sentence there at, at the end, that would not be a correct usage. And seeing it used in ways like that, again, is one of the ways that lets me know uh, that this person is not actually a fluent speaker in AAVE. So some important notes about AAVE and its usage and what I hope your takeaways from this are, are that it is not incorrect and correction is not needed and, and not appropriate unless you are correcting the person or your child in this case in a formal paper, in a letter, in some sort of document that is being used for a formal reason. But if the child is speaking a certain way, and certainly if they are speaking with their friends, there is no benefit in quote unquote correcting them about a phrase of speech that is grammatical and natural to them. It's also important to note that code switching, which is switching from different variations, is a totally normal thing that many, many people do. Any person that speaks more than one variation, whether it's AAVE in standard American English, whether it's English and Spanish, whether it's ASL, and whatever it is, people have ways of 
shifting in and out of those different codes, code switching. And this is totally normal, totally natural, a really standard part of how language works. And so this shouldn't be seen as something to be corrected, again, unless it's coming into a formal setting. Um, it really is something to be celebrated because it's a, a wonderful thing when someone can speak multiple variations. I also think it's important to understand that the way that language and linguistics works is such that it's totally understandable for you, the, the, the watcher here, to kind of fall in and out of using phrases that may fall under the umbrella of AAVE. Um, that, that is kind of what happens when you are with someone and your friends and they're familiar um, or you just have close proximity to them. And I understand this as a means of expressing closeness to people that you feel connected with. At the same time, I do think it's important to understand that appropriation, uh, the thin line between appreciation and appropriation is really, really thin. Um, and it's important to be very forthcoming with the people that you're connected to and to ask them maybe are, are you comfortable with me using this phrase what are you what are you thinking about this uh, and don't just assume that they feel okay with it because they're not saying something because again going back to the stereotype threat they may be feeling something and not feeling able to share it with you because of the fear of being perceived as aggressive or quote unquote pulling the race card or what have you it's really important to be forthright and direct about these things as much as possible um, and also understanding that the way that appropriation works is that people of color, our cultural features are often denigrated and demeaned and considered less than until a white person comes along and can either uh, commodify it, can put a price tag on it, or just uses it in some sort of prominent way, then it gets exalted. And there is an understandable conflict that occurs there of, you know, when I did this thing, it was perceived as negative. But when this person does this thing, they're not going to have the same negative connotations come to them. And that those feelings are understandable. Those feelings are very valid. And it's important to acknowledge those feelings. And I would say, you know, err on the side of Caution, make sure that you are aware of the language that you're using, make sure that you are aware of the cultural context of the language of the people around you, and just do your best to, again, be forthcoming and direct with the people that you're interacting with. And so now uh, I would like to talk about the history of policing in America. And I, I recognize that there are a lot of conversations coming about about police and policing. And these are really heavy, weighty topics. Uh, I am not, I am not, a, the purpose of this is not to give a critique about police. The purpose is to give awareness. The purpose is to give understanding about where the feelings that people of color have about policing comes from. And I hope that we can start with uh, just understanding the history of policing. So yes, police have come from essentially two iterations. In the Southern states, obviously this is during the time of slavery, slave patrols um, were erected. And in the Northern states, there were patrolmen. And this version was, essentially a private enterprise that was paid for by individual wealthier citizens. The later iteration was used to control immigrants. And this is sort of an irony stated because all of them were immigrants. The English um, and the people from the Le Netherlands were immigrants, but they had just immigrated sooner than the German and the Irish. But the German and the Irish had a culture that was perceived as offensive by the people who had immigrated just a little bit prior to them from England and the Netherlands. And what I think is important to note here is that essentially both of these iterations, the South and the North, were about property. Slaves were considered property. And that first iteration uh, about private, where private individual people paid for uh, the group of patrolmen, they were seeking either retribution or 
um, the return of items that were stolen from them. So all of it was about control and it was about uh, things that were owned by people. Our use of police has obviously grown and evolved over time. And currently police, uh, people call 911 for anything from permit violations to noise complaints to literal murder. And, and I think this is really important to note that police are, are in a position where they have to fend off calls from this wide array of violations. And, and it's a big stress on police departments. I, I can't imagine that law enforcement uh, are excited about things that you know, responding to 911 calls, which nominally is supposed to be about severe emergencies. If a, if a 911 calls, you're expecting it to be something on, along the lines of a murder. And then if you have a 911 call and it's for a permit violation, I think that just shows one, that we our use of police is so widely varied, it's so disparate and far, and, and that we could really use a unified mechanism for handling non-emergent or urgent incidents but unfortunately currently we do not. And so what ends up happening is that all of these things are siphoned through our police. Um, and that means that uh, police get weaponized against uh, people of color. Uh, if any of you are familiar with the Nextdoor app, I personally have seen many instances of people noting that they wanted to call the police for kids uh, playing football in the street, uh, people knocking on their doors for uh, solicitations. And I mean, I, I acknowledge that I don't like solicitors either, but I, it would not occur to me to call the cops because I got someone knocking on my door with a solicitation that I didn't want. Um, uh, Jennifer Schulte, the woman who was known as Barbecue Becky, again, going towards that permit violation, she was the one who got notoriety for calling the cops on the Black family for, I believe, using the wrong type of grill in the park. I can't remember if it was like charcoal versus gas or what have you, but that was why she called, again, 911. Hillary Brooke, Brooke Mueller is the woman who got famous for scrutinizing the gentleman who was going into their shared apartment building. She assumed that he didn't live there. Uh, he was filming her. And obviously uh, the very, very noteworthy one that happened just earlier this year with Amy Cooper and Christian Cooper. This is the case that happened in my hometown, New York in Central Park where Christian Cooper was the bird watcher who was speaking before the video started to Amy Cooper about having her dog unleashed in that part of the park where he was trying to watch birds. And then she called the cops and became very um, animated and uh, histrionic in her response as if he were attacking her and said to the 911 dispatcher, there's a man threatening me, he's attacking me and my dog, when it clearly was not happening based on the video that we saw. And this is just, you know, a slice of some of the instances that happen that cause many people of color to feel caution with their interactions with the police to feel uh, very concerned when a police is a police arise to the scenario. When you have situations like this, where uh, you know these are minor violations and people are responding with the same force that people respond to if someone is murdered, it lends itself to a feeling of uh, discontent and fear and anxiety. Um, and, and we really could benefit from, in addition to a disparate way of a, a different mechanism for, again, handling these non-emergent and urgent incidents, we certainly could also benefit from some interpersonal con conflict resolution methods. And, and I will say, I don't know if I have a clear answer for what that looks like. I just know that what we have currently, unfortunately, is leading to these kinds of incidents, is leading to this great divide where many people feel fearful of, of the police. Um, and on that note, I would like us to look at a video where there are Black parents talking to their children about the police. Uh, I will let you know that 
this video is a tough watch. It, it is uh, pretty much every time I watch it, I feel a little emotional and sometimes get teary eyed watching it. Um, but I think it's really important that we see these kinds of conversations, we hear these things and we understand exactly where this divide is. We actually have a line that we do at our house. We practice this thing. What is it? I'm Ariel Sky Williams. I'm eight years old. I'm unarmed and I have nothing that will hurt you. That's just kind of a thing we practice at our house. There are great police officers out there. There's also some police officers who are not so good. And my fear is that you run across one of those bad ones. For some reason, people of color have always been a target by the police. Before they became a policeman, they were a person. And that person took all their ideas and all their thoughts and all their prejudice into their job. Why, why would a police officer assume that you did something bad? Maybe because of my skin color. I remember being putting handcuffs for something that had nothing to do with me. I was literally walking in the mall. Cops slammed me on the ground, busted my lip, chipped my tooth. That actually made me really mad. How about the time they pulled us over with me in the car and arrested me and left all of you guys sitting in the car and nobody knew how to drive on the side of the road because the bumper on the car was kind of hanging off? No. You know, we live in Piala. There's people that don't even have a bumper on their car. My rear brake light wasn't working, and I got to my destination, and they were working. I was about your age, actually. They grabbed me. Why? I didn't know at the time. They just grabbed me. They threw me onto the police car. I got tased that time. That time they tased me because they said I wasn't complying. Ariel, are you okay? <laughs> What's wrong, baby? I'm okay, I'm alive, all right? Every day I get to see you, I get to do this, right? All right, come on, let's calm down, let's finish this, all right? You good? Hey, you make me cry. Come on. You have to be careful when you're out there in this world because this world's not gonna always be honest or fair to you. I know, Sean, you got a little bit lighter than the rest of them, so it's a possibility you won't get stopped. Sound like you just pulled them over. Okay. If you were driving, cop mm -hmm. pulls you over. Police gets out the car, comes to the window. T -t 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 -t. What would you do? License and registration, please, ma'am. Why do you think I pulled you over? I don't know. Tell me. When a police officer says something, you don't, don't. You're black. You can't be looking at them saying, "Oh, I don't know. Why don't you tell me?" Well, I mean, that right there is giving them to them the license to pull you out of your car and physically harm you because it will be done. Don't get upset, don't get sassy. Why did you pull me over? You don't have, I know how, just, just follow instructions and stay calm. Okay. Do you think just being a police officer and pulling you over, regardless of if you feel you've done something or not, they should get your respect? That's a tricky question. The answer is yes. Yes, if you gotta go to your wallet to get your ID, say, can I go reach in my back pocket to get my ID out? You could do what I do and I show them my hands so when they're walking up they see I don't have anything in my hands. I'm Errol Sky Williams and I have nothing that will harm, harm you or hurt you. And what's the next place you put your hands when you're driving or on the steering wheel with your hands out? If at all possible, turn on, your phone on. on. And call someone and put it on speaker. Yeah. But whatever you're doing, I want you to say what you're doing before you do it. You don't write any statements. Well, you have to write a statement. You don't have to write anything. You're a minor. I'm responsible for you. No one can tell you anything else. If he tells you to be quiet, be quiet. Do everything that you can to get back to me. I see it uh, weighing on you, and I don't want it to weigh on you. I'm just worried about Donovan. I'm worried about him now. Who are you guys talking about? Our, our, her, my nephew <laughs> and her cousin. I don't want him to be shot. I don't want him to go to jail. <laughs> um, 
You guys, if you could say anything to please, what would you say? Learn about people. Learn about their problems. Take some diversity training. I mean, it should be like in every, at this point, like a monthly requirement. You know, there's really nothing at this point that they could do that would make me feel any safer with them without them just point blank, clearing them all out, and starting all over from scratch. So don't always assume that all of them are bad. Mm -hmm. but uh, always. But but all you see on the news and in newspapers, and it keeps happening. It's just in a different way. It's like how people are like, you should forgive so-and-so, but they keep doing it to me. I, forget, I forgave them, but they keep doing it to me. It's, it gets harder and harder to forgive them. Wow. So that's a tough, right? So that's, that's a tough watch. Some things that I want to note. Um, obviously, those are real parents, real kids. And, and it's really important to be aware that these are real interactions and that the distinction between the experiences that people of color have with the police and that white people have with the police can be uh, pretty disparate. They, they can be pretty far. And it's really important. There is this inclination that I, I can understand to because of your experiences, if they are positive with the police, to say, well, they're not all that way. And, and, and that's absolutely true. And in fact, let's jump down to that next uh, statement. So humans in every job are varied. Uh, I think that the concept of the bell curve as far as IQ is very overstated, if not completely flawed, but the concept of the bell curve as far as how people perform on any job is right on. That is a really good standard. So what does that look like? The bell curve that we've all seen of any sort of uh, striatic stats where generally speaking most people are kind of you know okay you know decent enough at their job and there are a few cases of people that are exceptional that they are really wonderful that they are born to do that job and then you have people at the other end of the spectrum that are just terrible that are either incompetent that are lazy that are you know got the job because of nepotism or what have you the challenge here with a job like police is that when people are bad, the level of harm that they can cause can be stratospheric. And when you have people committing stratospheric harm in a powerful job, that you are going to have very disparate uh, experiences like this. You're gonna have people having to make a risk assessment of how deadly someone will be, even if they fall within that well, they're okay, spectrum of the bell curve, that person is still fearful that, well, this person may be one of those people at the terrible end of that. And in order to protect themselves, they have to make that assessment. And it's, understand, it's important to know that, that that is the assessment that many people of color are making when they're having these interactions with the police and that it's important to validate that that these incidents that are that you see in the media are not cre created they're not manufactured they're real and they have a real impact on how people feel about the police and so th that last point there i don't want them to lose their innocence i hear you know different versions of that from parents and you know again as someone that has kids herself i completely understand that um, my, my oldest is seven, well, excuse me, he was 17 when he came to our family, he's now 23. So he came to our family with his own, you know, understanding about the world, his own value set, uh, some of which I hope that, you know, my husband and I helped to mold, but he still came to us with a lot of information. Uh, my daughter was born to us. And so I lament having to talk to her about 
these sorts of things. But I don't feel as though I have the ability to not. Um, I don't want her to lose her innocence either, but I would prefer for her to have hard conversations about big topics, whether it's police, racism, uh, religion, whatever big topic within our family unit and to get an understanding about it from us as opposed to learning the hard way by going out into the world and having to contend with it without any of the foreknowledge that we can give her. And so that's more or less where I leave you with. I, I hope that what you get from this is an appreciation that these conversations are very, very hard, but it's so worth it to have them with your children, with your friends, with your coworkers, with your colleagues. It's important to enrich your relationships with the people around you by having the humility and, and the empathy to be willing to have these tough conversations and hear some things that may challenge your worldview. And, and I thank you for being here and listening to me. And now I would love to hear any questions that anyone has. Thank you, Ebony. Let me see if we have any questions coming in. I just want to say that I enjoyed this very much. And again, I learned a lot more even from the first presentation I saw from you. So I'm so glad. Yes, and thank you for those videos. They do make you think both of them. Um, I've been very conscious of the of the um, the stereotype threat myself. I mean, and it you have there's different stereotypes no matter who you are, even throughout your life, like at different stages of your life. And that's what's been um, kind of interesting for me to notice lately is the different stereotypes through life, through ageism or whatever. Um, so I, I, I really, that was an interesting study from Stanford. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for that. I, and I meant to put a note on it and say that, you know, this is women, this is, you know, this is not just people of color, it's women, like you said, it's older people, it's, you know, people with limited uh, physical mobility, it, 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 it expands all kinds of people. That's why I like that he said, anyone, this affects all of us, because yeah. everybody is part of a group that will be stereotyped in one way or another. Yes, I, I mean, it, it, it pertains to everyone. I mean, there's not one person that it doesn't. But I thought a lot of your training did as well. So I appreciate the kind of just the how to open the door on those sensitive conversations with your with your child. And even when you were talking about Ebonics again, I was thinking about, I wonder if school teachers are educated um, and what that means and, and how, how they manage that in the classroom, um, because I think that would be a really important part of someone's identity. Um, so I hope that is taught in the schools. Unfortunately, it isn't uh, what happened after the incident in Oakland. What that that's exactly what they were trying to do. That I mean, it's it's so funny that you say that because they were like, hey, let's let's talk about this and let's be really clear that the kids are already speaking it. So let's talk about it. Let's make the connections. And I know you saw my other uh, presentation where I have the video about it and it shows the kids uh, making the connection to the AAVE sentence and translating it into standard American English and seeing just how they grew in their understanding about both of those uh, language features and how it was an enriching experience for the children. But unfortunately, there was such a strong backlash to mm -hmm. Ebonics that they squashed that. So those protocols were no longer allowed to be used. And as, essentially, any other school board was scared to do anything similar because they saw the way that uh, it became a national conversation when it came out of one city of one state. And it was a national, because I remember this conversation, it was a national conversation, but it was the wrong conversation. So they- Absolutely. On the wrong, it wasn't even, it wasn't valid. So um, mm -hmm. I remember that being like a hot topic in my own home. I mean, that was mm -hmm. that was a big deal, but that's, I studied communications. So that's one of the things that it's all about how you, how you form that original hypothesis and how you, how you 
talk about it, how you, how you bring that to the public. And that was unfortunately done very incorrectly, but uh, thank you so much. I'm not seeing any additional questions, but the good news is, is we're going to get to talk to Ebony again in our podcast called Reframed. So look for that later in the month. Um, we'll be we'll be bringing you some great information. And if there's anything that comes up that you would like to talk about, just let us know. I'll put my email in the chat, um, and, and um, we can also send out Ebony's email if she's open to that. I don't know. Oh, she absolutely. Has <laughs> you can see it right here on the slide. <laughs> Um, and so please feel free to reach out to her. She's very um, responsive and um, just a great resource for us. I hope that you learned a lot today and I hope you come back to Gliding University. Like I said, there's going to be information, um, a little link sent to you so you can get your CEUs. Um, until then, I hope you have a wonderful week and thank you, Ebony. Thank you, Jennifer. It's so nice seeing you again. You too. Bye-bye.